Hey everybody, I'm Lee Yanko. I'm a product manager here at Google Cloud, and I am joined today by Randall Monroe, author of the new book, What If Two? Additional Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions. You may also know Randall from his webcomic, XKCD, which I'm pretty sure it's a legal requirement to read if you're gonna be a software engineer here at Google. So Randall, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So for those that have never read the first What If, uh, could you briefly explain the general concept of the book? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess you could summarize it as it's like a, a Dear Abby, but for people who want to like crash moons into each other. But it started off when I was doing my comics uh, about, you know, a lot of math and science topics. And one of the things that surprised me was people started writing to me to try to get me to settle arguments that they were having with their friends about, you know, like, could Superman do this? Or if you had something like this moving at the speed of light and it collided with this, what would happen? And they would always be like, you know, my friends and I have been arguing about this and it didn't seem like an important enough question to bother a real scientist, but we both, we both agreed you seemed like a good person to ask. Um, and I mean, they were, they were sort of, they were right. I uh, would get these questions and then I would get sucked into trying to answer them and I would end up, you know, spending six hours going down all these research rabbit holes, you know, papers, calculations, and then finally come up with an answer. And it would be like, you know, six hours later, it's like three in the morning. And I would write these long emails explaining like, okay, I've worked out the answer. Here's why it's this. Here's why it's not this. You might be, expect this to happen, but there's this cool effect I learned about. Um, and then, and then at some point I realized like, I should probably save some of these. Like maybe other people would be interested in reading these answers too. And then that led me to start soliciting questions on my website and and uh, eventually writing up all my answers in What If. Sounds pretty similar to the uh, origin story for the Guinness Book of World Records. It's kind of yeah. Break, it's always been weird. It's like oh yeah, why yeah, like why why is a beer company in charge of world records? Oh well, it, it works. You know, someone has yep. to be. People are getting drunk and asking each other questions with no answers at the time. So um, as an example, what's what's your favorite question in the new book and favorite answer? And those could be two different uh, questions, I guess. Um, so I found one thing that I found was that uh, a lot of my favorite questions come from little kids because mm. um, adults will ask questions that are more complicated and more like trying to make them interesting and sciencey. And they'll often like try to make them deliberately destructive. You know, so they're like, oh, what, what's something that'll create a cool explosion or a cool science effect or something. But little kids just ask questions that they want to know the answer to. Um, and they'll be simpler, but often like way more fun to explore. So one of the, the, one of the questions, one of my favorites in What If 2 is from a five-year-old named Amelia, who asked, what would happen if the solar system were filled with soup out to Jupiter? <laughs> Um, and I like this because it's like such a simple question, but it, it is surprisingly destructive and takes you through some really, uh, unexpectedly interesting physics. Um, you know, looking at how this huge amount of, of mass collected in one place, it would form a black hole, which would collapse, but like how it would collapse and what you would experience if you were near it are sort of surprising. And, uh, and then the effect it would have on the galaxy around it, uh, it really ended up being a, a, a really cool question. I think one of my favorite short answer questions in the new book was, uh, I, what, what is the smallest change that would have the largest effect? I think it's just adding one proton to every atom. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Someone <laughs> someone was like uh, trying to to suggest like, what's the smallest change you can make to the universe that would that would really mess things up? And 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 then they suggested adding a proton to every atom, and that seems to me like maybe the biggest change you could make. Um, I think you know maybe my favorite answer was um, someone asked what stars would smell like if you could smell them, if it were possible mm. to smell them. Um, and and then and I found that like surprisingly, you can you can sort of answer this. Like you can look at what that kind of plasma um, does to the lining of your nose when you're exposed to small amounts of it and and even how it affects your taste buds. And so you can, in a sense, answer by you know learning about stellar chemistry and how smell works and how taste works. Um, you can you can actually sort of answer that question. Like it's impossible to taste solar plasma, but if you just make a few simplifying assumptions, um, hmm. you learn that stars would smell like, sort of like burning hair or uh, bleach, hmm. and they would taste sour. And those are both like weirdly concrete answers, which uh, yeah. kind of surprised me. 
So, so how do you choose uh, which of hundreds or thousands of questions from seven-year-olds you're going to answer? How, how far do you get in exploring a question before you decide it is or isn't interesting enough to include in, the, in a book? So I try to answer a lot of questions that people send in. And usually I, if, if I, the ones that I don't include most often, it's because the answer is too easy to figure out. Mm. Like, like it'll be an interesting question. You have to do a calculation, but it's one calculation and then you've got the answer and you're like, oh, okay. And there's not like, it doesn't like suggest anything else. Um, and so, so a lot of the time I will answer them just for my own curiosity, you know, I'm like, oh, I want to know what that answer is. Oh, okay. It's this cool. You know, um, and, but I also, there, I'll also get questions where I don't know the answer and I can't even think of a way that you would begin to approach it. Um, I think the sweet spot, like the perfect kinds of questions are ones where I see the question and I am immediately curious what the answer is. And I don't know, but like, I have a guess or like, I have an idea mm -hmm. of how to figure it out. And then I feel like, like hearing a really cool question like that, it's sort of like getting a song stuck in your head where you're like, okay, until I answer this, I just can't pay attention to anything else. And so I'll like, uh, end up sometimes doing like a fair amount of work to answer them, even if I don't end up including them in, in what if. What's the longest you've spent researching an answer? I don't know. I think the longest I've spent on a portion of an answer, um, there was a question that was almost one of those ones where the answer is like so simple that it, it didn't seem that interesting. Um, so someone asked what would happen if they tried to funnel all the water from Niagara Falls through a, a soda straw. And this is like a, it's sort of a surprisingly simple calculation to do. You can just go like if you find the flow rate of water over Niagara Falls and the cross-sectional area of a drinking straw and you divide the two numbers, um, you get an answer in units of speed and it tells you how fast the water would have to go to go through the straw. And it turns out to be like a third the speed of light. And so like, you can have some fun illustrating what would happen if you tried to do that, you know, if you had a way of doing that. But, um, you know, the, the short answer is like, you, you can't put that much water through that. It would, uh, it would you'd need a, a particle cannon, not an actual like stream of water. <laughs> but the, in the course of answering this, I had to look up those two amounts, the, mm -hmm. the um, cross-sectional area of a straw. And I use like the stand, the McDonald's straw. I figure like that's the average straw. And then, um, and then I needed the flow rate over Niagara Falls. And if you if you Google that, you'll see like the places that report the number. Um, and and I'll occasionally, you know, no no slight intended to Google's answer box that pops up for that. But like I like you know I like to try to you know figure out okay where does this come from? How do we know that it's that much, et cetera? Hmm. And it turns out in the case of um, Niagara Falls, the flow rate is determined by a treaty between the U.S. and Canada. And like both countries have an interest in maintaining the falls as a natural wonder, but also like both want to withdraw water for use for different things. And so there is a treaty that sets what the minimum flow rate over the falls is. And, and, uh, and then the treaty mentioned that the, each country will appoint one officer who will jointly, so these two appointees will jointly oversee compliance with the treaty and certify that the right amount of water is flowing over Niagara Falls. And like when I heard this, I was like, wait a minute. So we have like international waterfall police who are like mm -hmm. a point. And, 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 and in my head, these people immediately became like Mulder and Scully, <laughs> um, you know, and, and like maybe their, rep their procedure is like, if, if the countries are out of compliance, they just like file a, a motion or report or something. But I like to think that they're like empowered to go return the water uh, by any means necessary. Um, <laughs> But like, I, I didn't want to like write out, okay, I'm going to, you know, get completely derailed by my, uh, you know, water, international waterfall police fan fiction. But um, <laughs> I did want to mention who the current appointees were, you know, and so I went to look it up and thus began a good like eight hour multi-day quest where I kept, it turns out there are just like so many different committees Hmm. that uh, oversee the each of the Great Lakes and then different aspects of them, shipping, environmental stuff. Um, and then there's like an international joint committee for waterways that sort of over, it's like a super committee overseeing the whole thing. And 
they all have websites of varying degrees of up to date. And I just spent so long because like I, I didn't know like who would oversee this. You know, like I, I got the text of the treaty, but like when a treaty says like this shall happen, where does it happen? And I ended up, I get like an out of date answer. Hmm. Um, but then like when I was doing a different question about laws, um, I had gotten in touch with the librarians at Harvard Law School. Um, and the the law librarians, they were helping me answer this this other what if question. And then it occurred to me, I was like, hey, this is a law thing. Do you know when a treaty says so and so will be appointed? Like, where does that get recorded? Who huh. who certifies that? And they were like, oh, uh, yeah, hang on, we can look into that for you. And then like within like, you know, half an hour or so, like some really short amount of time, I one of them emails me back and is like, hey, we got in touch with the Joint Commission on Waterways. <laughs> <laughs> and the you know the 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 chair of the commission is like here's here's an email from them saying here are the two appointees you know currently are so and so and so and so and and they're really nice and let us know if you have any other questions huh. and and I, and it and my first lesson from that was definitely just that librarians are really cool um like they uh, and also it made me reflect a little on like I've never felt more like a member of my like generational stereotype than then when something like this makes me realize just what lengths I will go to to avoid like making a phone call. <laughs> yeah, I remember a teacher of mine in high school saying uh, the best way to brighten up a librarian's day is ask them if they can help you research how to build an A-bomb. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's all that's, public. That's, the hard mm -hmm. part's the particle accelerator. Or sorry, the uh, yeah. centrifuge, the centrifuge. Mm -hmm. So uh, cool. I want to remind the audience we will have questions. So if you do have questions for Randall, please put them uh, in the uh, question box. We will be selecting them at some point towards the end of the conversation. Um, cool. So everything in your book reminds me of the questions that we at Google used to ask in interviews. Why is a manhole cover round? Uh, how many ping pong balls can fit in a 747? Give me all the uses for a traffic cone, stuff like that. We've stopped asking those questions. Uh, but but what do you think is kind of like the general utility, societal utility of asking and answering these kinds of absurd questions that don't really have any practical use per se? Um, a lot of the a lot of the questions are ridiculous, but then like the techniques that you apply to answer them um, can be applied to to ridiculous and non ridiculous things alike. Uh, so it's I mean it's sort of like science doesn't you know, doesn't care if the questions you're asking it are ridiculous, it's just like whether uh, there is an answer there. Um, and so, so I kind of like how you can, you can take any of these questions, you know, the, the way that, you know, water will uh, uh, compress if it's like uh, a giant ball of soup being contracted by gravity, like how the temperature and pressure will relate to each other as as the the sphere of soup collapses, which is like as impractical a question as there is. But like, those are the same temperature and pressure relations that you use if you're trying to figure out how, you know, fluid will behave in, in pipes or do some like serious engineering problems. Um, I, I, I feel like a lot of the different questions, you know, the techniques that I reach for are techniques that are developed for usually solving some practical problem. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, serving as a sneaky example of like giving people examples of how to apply these tools, but then they know how to apply, how to apply them, um, you know, hmm. in practical things. And, uh, uh, you know, out, like there are plenty of non-ridiculous problems that they're ideally then have the tools to solve. But also I think just satisfying curiosity is like worthwhile. For sure. I like uh, I like for the soup question. You were able to give a very concrete answer to the question, but you uh, you couldn't say for sure whether you eat or drink soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of those like categorization debates where I feel like like there's just there's never a you can always have someone who comes along who's like I consider soup to be a like you know like there's the the uh, people who claim cereal is soup, um, the people who claim. So I, I, it always reminds me like, you know, the hot, is a hot dog a sandwich? Yep. Is water wet kind of debates? I'm going to start arguing that hot dogs are soup. I, uh, is a pop tart a ravioli is the real question. What happens if you cook a ravioli according to the instructions on a pop tart container? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Probably drips into your uh, toaster. Yeah. Right. You have to buy a new toaster after. <laughs> 
<laughs> you are uh, good. He had like some nice grill marks on the rabbit. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll experiment with this after the talk. We'll save it for the next book. <laughs> what if three food questions only? Um, you seem to have a knack for being able to explain complex uh, scientific technical topics in a way that laymen can understand, um, and we've seen that this is critically important um, to get right over the past couple of years with some failures in science and technical communication from the CDC, other people um, that were around. How do you do it? What's your secret uh, to explaining this? What would you give? What advice would you give the CDC to uh, improve their science communication for the next time? Oh my gosh, I, uh, I, I don't know. I think um, one thing that I always try to think about is like when I'm explaining something, when I when I write out my explanations, I'm really not trying to think of like, okay, what about a person who just doesn't know anything? How would I explain this to them? Because um, that seems sort of condescending, you know, and mm. sort of um, uh, uh, like I I feel like you should you should try to always give people credit and you know assume that they are they are kind of interested and you know they might not have all of the background you do, but um, but what I try to do is I imagine that I was going back in time and trying to give like to be to me before I understood all this. And I want to give myself like as quick an update as possible. Like I want to save myself all the time of all that research I did hmm. and just be like, okay, here are the really, you know, like here is the best way I've figured out to think about it without all the blind alleys I went down without all of the, you know, ideas that turned out not to be right. Um, and just try to give like as punchy a, a, an explanation as possible. Cause like I try to think of it as, it's not that people don't understand stuff or not aren't interested in stuff. I always try to just think, I imagine that they're really busy, you mm. know? So like, I try to think mm. like, what if I'm talking to someone and I only get a little of their attention? What's the best use of that that I can make, you know? Mm. And I think that like reframing it in that way makes it less about like, sort of setting yourself up in opposition to people and like arguing with them um, or like, like, you know, trying to like dumb down the stuff you're saying, but just think like, like, these are people who have a lot going on, I'm going to try to have respect for that and, and, and just give them information and, and not try to overthink too much what they're going to do with it or how they're going to, you know, um, what they're going to decide, like, don't try to, to game it out too much, just be like, here is the information as simply and clearly as I could present it for you to incorporate into your busy life. Reminds me of when I used to do improv, they used to say, uh, play to the top of your intelligence and trust the audience's intelligence as well. Yeah, I I really feel like, like people understand different scientific stuff to different degrees, but like everyone can understand, everyone can tell when they're being condescended to. And so <laughs> like, you can't, you just, you can't think about people that way is my, mm, so that's sure. like a core thing I believe. Uh, anybody ever write into you to uh, debate or uh, contest an answer you gave? Anything ever change your mind from that? Yeah, you know, so there's a question that I answered in the first what if um, about what would happen if you, someone asked, uh, would it be possible to cook a steak by dropping it from a high enough altitude <laughs> that it would be like perfectly cooked when it hit the ground and landed like, I guess, on your plate? Um, and this is like a really fun question. And because stuff that falls into the atmosphere, if it falls from high up, it, uh, you know, gets heated up by compressing the air in front of it. And you end up with, uh, uh, like it, as it gets lower in the atmosphere, it slows down because the air is thicker. And so you have to figure out like how, if you drop it from too high, it'll just get heated and heated, heated and, and burn up. But mm -hmm. if you drop it from too low down, it won't get heated enough. And I had fun researching this because like you can use the same uh, formulas you use for spacecraft reentry heating and like the atmospheric profiles from aerodynamics to figure out how quickly it'll slow down. Um, and and I actually spent a while trying to figure out how would the heat flow through the steak because the bulk flow of heat through materials is like it, it it's just like a sort of annoying calculus problem. And, and I always get like bogged down in the algebra. And so I'm like, okay, the, what are the thermal, thermal uh, conductivity coefficients for like flesh? Uh, I don't know. And I like end up going to like food processing engineering text because I can't figure that out. And I finally get some coefficients, but I don't know if they're the right one. 
the right ones to figure out how this heat will propagate through the steak. And then after like 30 or 45 minutes of this, I kind of sheepishly realized that there is a different area of scholarship that has like a lot of data on how heat applied to one side of a steak will affect the rest of the steak. Um, <laughs> and then I went and got a cookbook. Um, and, and so I had, uh, you know, and that answered the question, which is like, yeah. you basically, no matter how high you drop a steak from, if it's, if it survives to the ground, the, in, the outside is going to be like crisp, but then the inside is still going to be raw. But some there was people, some people like their steak that way. Yeah, yeah, they call it Pittsburgh rare. It was like mm -hmm. the name for the, the idea was I think steel workers would like slap the steak down on the molten, you know, the ingots mm -hmm. as they come out of the the furnace. But um, the the there was one bit though that I wasn't sure about where where you have to talk about how the steak you have to think about how the steak is going to fall to figure out what its drag coefficient is going to be, and. <laughs> There's a lot of research on how objects, how like debris tumbles in the air. Um, they do this for like spacecraft reentry, trying to figure out where the, how quickly the debris is going to go slow down, where it's going to land. Um, but most of the papers on this are for like very idealized pieces of debris. They use, you know, aluminum panels, like solar panel bits, engine parts, you mm -hmm. know, discs, et cetera. They didn't have like food. <laughs> and... So I was like, I don't know how a steak would behave in a hypersonic, like raw steak would behave uh, at Mach 2 or Mach 3. You know, I don't, I, like in general, when stuff falls at supersonic speeds, it tends to fall into a, the stable configuration where it's presenting its largest uh, surface to, you know, uh, uh, falling with that surface first. But, you know, uh, uh, this is just really hard to model and really hard to get answers for. And so what I ended up doing was just writing like, I, I put it sort of as a joke. I was like, I couldn't find any data on how a steak tumbles at hypersonic speeds, but if you have a wind tunnel capable of those speeds uh, and want to gather some data, totally let me know. And a couple of years later, I get an email from these uh, two PhD students from the University of Manchester who were like, hey, we were just finishing our doctoral research and we, um, we uh, had a couple of hours left on the, the wind tunnel and we... Uh, we just one of us decided to run to the grocery store and get some steak and gather some data for you. <laughs> and so they actually tried subjecting a steak to hypersonic winds. Um, and I feel like quantitatively, I felt validated by their results. <laughs> like the steak did sort of heat up char and then the charred material ablated away roughly how I uh, was going, you know, like was expecting it to. Um, they did send a few pictures of like after the the winds were turned off and i would say the steak looked significantly less appetizing than i have <laughs> like a steak that has been subjected to hypersonic <laughs> winds looks like it pretty ragged yeah um, i can imagine and they, and they did mention that after they were done the um the, the entire inside of the wind tunnel was like had flecks of raw meat uh, all over it so they spent a while cleaning it um but they uh they did not get kicked out and did end up getting their PhDs. So that was very exciting. Nice, nice. Reminder to the audience, uh, questions coming up soon. Please, if you have any, make sure you you type them in. Uh, what is a what if question that you wish someone else throughout all of history would answer? What's the question? Who is that somebody else? Oh man, I don't know. Um, that is a good question. I, I've, um... So I had a question that I that I answered about uh, in What If Two about walking across the country, where someone if, if someone wanted to know if they wanted to walk across the country from like Texas to New York, um, where each step plunges them back in time by you know like a, a thirty days or something, um, where the whole trek would take about three hundred thousand years, what would they experience? And I really like this kind of question because like you can. It's weird to imagine what it would be like to walk across a landscape as like time runs in reverse and as you get to like see stuff happening, all of it's happening like on geologic time scales, like trees disappearing into the ground and, uh, you know, clouds moving around, uh, uh, you know, the weather changing, the sun moving up and down in the sky with the seasons. Um, but it's really interesting trying, like I spent a lot of time for this going through like uh, reconstructions of the different glaciations in North America, mm -hmm. figuring out like, where would the glaciers be? What were the environments like? And, and you can read these reconstructions, but 
it's sort of like, like, you never know, like, but what would it really feel like? Like, what would mm -hmm. it look like? You know, and, and, you know, we think it was like this type of environment with this type of trees, you know, this type of, you know, rocks, there were probably, you know, grasses, these animals, but like, it's still hard to put all those together and really get a picture of what it would feel like, like, what would it remind you of? And, and it's also hard, um, you know, North America's had these cycles of glaciation where uh, big ice sheets push down through across the continent and then withdraw. And we've got really good maps of like the most recent one. Mm. But then like before that, like the evidence from the previous uh, glaciations gets wiped away by the new ones. And so a lot of the reconstructions are like much fuzzier when you go further back. And I don't know, I was once standing on a hill uh, near Boston looking at the city and and it didn't occur to me until right then that like how deep the ice was just, you know, 20,000, 25,000 years ago. Like I was looking at the skyline with all the with all the buildings and then thinking like if the buildings are this tall, like the ice would have been like this deep. And that just blew my mind. And it just makes me think like, like I know what these things look like intellectually. Like, you know, I know what I know the measurements, you know, the numbers and stuff, but that would just be a weird a weird different world and so i sort of want someone to go there and just like write a just be able to just write a description you know and like uh take maybe take some pictures yeah that ice sheet came all the way to a uh, statue of liberty i mean long island itself was formed by a two thousand foot wall that had sand wash up against it for a couple thousand years yeah yeah cape cod and then the the islands nantucket martha's vineyard those are all sort of the same way they're all these like really probably kind of temporary berms that were pushed mm. up by the, you know, and then by the the water draining off of the ice sheets uh, piling up there. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's glacial geology is just really cool. What is a, any, any answer that you, you researched in great depth and then decided, no, I'm not going to include that for some reason. Um, yeah, there were a few of those. Um, yeah, I spent, I spent, I, and, and some of them are ones that I may still write up, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, I know I spent a while answering a question about, uh, there's a, a scene from an old Disney movie where a hare is, it's a tortoise and the hare thing and the hare is playing tennis against itself. And so it's like hitting the ball, running to the other side, hitting the ball back. And I, I spent quite a while trying to figure out like to model, like, what would you physically need? to be able to hit a ball and then accelerate using legs fast enough to get to the other side of the tennis court to hit it back. Um, and like, uh, uh, you know, what, like how fast was that hair moving? What was it, what were, what must its legs have been like? Um, and, and I didn't end up writing that up. I guess at a certain point, I always, I feel like, um, sometimes when you're like really analyzing fictional works, you you're doing like frame by frame analysis, but like in the end, you're just like trying to work backward and figure out like what an artist decided to draw. You know, it's <laughs> not like, it's not really like telling you something about the world. Um, Th that being said, some of your more interesting answers come from uh, first concluding that it's impossible and then saying, well, let's assume we have a magic fire pole or something like that. What would the implications be? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and see, that's what I what I like to do is is say like like the whole premise of what if is like I think of it as like you set up these starting conditions, and we don't say how they're set up. We're just hypothesizing them, you know, and then saying like we press play, let physics take over. What does it do, you know? Um, and so now and then the answer is like you press play and like the situation falls apart in a very boring way, and like sometimes you're like, you know, there's a small tweak you could make here that would suddenly put you in a totally different situation. Yep. And so it's, and it's like, it would be a shame not to like talk about that now that it's, now that it's on the table. Like, well, what if you make this small tweak? Hey, look, now this is really cool. Like it has a cool mm -hmm. answer. It's a, you know, a fun question. And then, and then, um, and so sometimes I'll be like, what if this, well, that's boring, but what if this small change? And then that ends up being more fun. Last question before going to the audience. Uh, how many times did you get tripped up on converting from US standard to metric? 
<laughs> God, no, I mean, that's always been like the, the bane of my existence. Um, you know what I really love is like one of my favorite, just like uniform, um, complete, like good things technology has given us is computers can keep track of units now. Mm. And that's one of the reasons I, I use Mathematica a lot. And one of the reasons I like it is it has pretty good, uh, pretty good system for like unit aware computing. And so you can write out equations and have variables and each variable is tagged with its unit. And then you, you like let the computer handle the, the conversion to SI. You can like put in feet and like hectares and like liters and you know, the furlongs like all together into an equation and then get the answer out in the right unit and not, you know, trip yourself up by going back and forth. Um, and, and this is just like, it's sort of like when, when phones started being able to record phone numbers for you. Hmm. Like, I remember people saying like, oh, but, but we're not memorizing phone. Now we don't know anyone's phone number. And I'm like, yeah, it's true. I'm losing that ability. Like I'm, I no longer have large parts of my brain devoted to memorizing phone numbers, but maybe that's okay. Like yeah. I would rather like do use it for other stuff. More, more I mean, space for baseball like statistics. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and weird trivia about glaciers, but it, <laughs> I still do get tripped up by, um, like I'll read like kilo and think mega, and then I'll mm. write it down wrong somewhere or, you know, like I'll million and billion. Sometimes I type the wrong word. Like I, I you know, I, I mix up words like that sometimes. So that I still have to watch out, but now it's not as much metric to imperial, you know, like metric to like standard conversions and more um, converting from uh, like 10 to the sixth to 10 to the ninth, mm. you know, uh, uh, kilo versus milliwatts, et cetera. Cool. I think it's time to go to the audience for some audience questions. All right. Aaron Wolf asks, have you ever built a model or ran physical experiments to help answer a question? Um, yeah, I've, I've, um, if we're talking about, you know, physical building, physical, uh, models of things. Um, one thing occasionally there's a question where I spend a lot of time researching it and then I realize, wait, there is an easier way to answer this. Um, one of them for one of the, one of the questions I answered a while ago, I, I, had to figure out a bunch of properties of pollen, including whether it was flammable or not. And, and I was reading a bunch of papers and then, and then, and like botany papers had data on a lot of properties of bulk properties of different pollens, but it was hard to figure out any specific one, whether it's flammable or not. And then I realized that like the world is full of teenagers with access to YouTube and I can just go find someone who tried lighting pollen on fire in their driveway and, and <laughs> answered like, yes, it's very flammable and also don't do that. Uh, but so in a, um, when I was doing a question for uh, what if two, I had a point where I needed to figure out what are, what's the bulk density of like hard candies. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things where it's like, if you go to a candy company website, they don't have a lot of engineering properties. And if you go to, um, you know, you can like look it up and you'll find someone who just asserted that it's so-and-so, you know, kilograms per liter, but then you'll find someone else asserting something different. Um, and like, here's one ISO standard hard candy and it has this density, but then you're like, is that actually like a, a normal hard candy or is that some weird thing? And then I, at, at some point I realized, wait a minute, I can just go fill a glass of water and drop a hard candy in and see like, oh yeah, it's much dense. They're much denser than water. Um, and that was, uh, it, again, short circuiting a bunch of research that I've yeah. gotten bogged down in forever. Makes sense. Cool. Next question. Mark asks, how do you research answers to something outside of the areas you're familiar with? Um, I think it really depends on like what kind of question it is. Often I will just go and look and, and say, okay, have there been papers written about anything at least similar to this? You know, if I'm studying like hard candies, just go look for, you know, papers on sugar chemistry and see what kinds of sugars people are writing papers about. What kind of, you know, go look at the can are there candy industry, you know, papers, are there their food industry, food science papers? Um, you know, I'll go like I spend lots of time browsing Wikipedia just anyway. So often I'll be like, hey, now I'm curious about, it. I'm just gonna read what are the summaries of the whole, like the Wikipedia article on candy, let's learn about candy. Um, 
often though i will i'll find like here's a paper it seems like this is generally about the area that i'm interested in but i don't know whether i'm applying it right and then i will sometimes see like is there one person who's written a bunch of papers on this um often that you know if i do overcome my reluctance to make a phone call or send an email often they're like like i find scientists are often really excited to talk about their work and like have fun thinking about how to apply it to different things so mm. uh yeah sometimes and then, and then i have a few experts like i know you know i know i know people in in different fields where i think oh i don't know this but i bet so and so does and so i'll reach out to like a chemist i know or someone and, and get pointers from them for where to go next what's the most off the wall conversation you've had with one of those people you've reached out to oh i don't know um I, so this isn't this isn't um, this isn't for the inside of the book, but for the outside cover, the cover of What If Two. Um, on both books, I have a cover that's not it's a drawing that's not taken from any specific question. It's just sort of an illustration with a dinosaur in it that like gets across the vibe of the book. And so on What If Two, it's a T Rex on the roof of an airliner that's taking off, and it's kind of <laughs> through the roof. And while I was drawing that, um, I spent a while trying to figure out, uh, could the airliner support the weight of a T-Rex? Huh. It turns out airplanes are really, really strong. And like the, <laughs> the, as long as it's managed to, to not step between any of the supports, like uh, an airliner can easily support that much weight. Huh. But for a previous book, I had interviewed uh, astronaut uh, Chris Hadfield, who is oh. a test pilot who's landed over a hundred different aircraft. And what I did for that book was I was writing a chapter on how to land a plane. And so he had like graciously agreed to answer my questions. And so I made a list of questions to ask him. Um, and I sort of arranged them from like the least ridiculous to the most ridiculous about like different scenarios. Like how would you land a plane under these circumstances? And my plan was to just ask him like going down the list, ask him one question after another and see how far I could get before he hung up on me. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I started with the simple questions, like, I, I think I asked what, uh, if you have to make an emergency landing, but there are no airports or roads, and you have to go for a farmer's field, what crop should you aim for? Yeah. And, and then turn, and he immediately says, you know, well, that's not a ridiculous question at all. When, when you fly small planes, you think about that stuff all the time. And then he started rattling off different crops and what times of year you should land in them. Uh, and, you know, like uh, which ones would affect your planes, which way and which ones would make you flip over. Um, and then he, uh, uh, and I found, so I started working my way to my list of questions and realized like, I guess I should have occurred to me, but test pilots are not easy to fluster by throwing <laughs> ridiculous situations at them. Um, it's all like, uh, and, and I got to the end of my list and he was like, cool, do you have any others, you know? Uh, and and uh, I was like, no, I'll have to get back to you. So as a consequence of doing this, you know, it, we had such a great time talking. Um, so as a consequence of this though, I did have his phone number. Mm. So while I was drawing this T-Rex on top of an airplane, I, I figured out, okay, I think it would support the weight. Um, but so then I'd like, I t take a picture of the drawing and just text it to him uh, and, and say, how do you think this plane would handle? <laughs> and and, and uh, it, he's so great. He immediately texts back like, uh, pretty well, as long as the T-Rex doesn't wander too far forward or backward, uh, you're gonna... <laughs> Uh, if you, if the center of gravity is too far off, you can't compensate with the control surfaces and you're going to stall or go into a dive. And then he sent me a picture of like the shuttle carrier aircraft, which is the plane that they carried the space shuttle on, where they just sort of mounted it on top and uh, and it worked pretty well. Uh, like, you know, it, it, it flew with a space shuttle piggyback on it. Um, by the way, I think my favorite my favorite joke in like all of engineering is that on the top of the shuttle carrier aircraft, there's a mounting point where it's like where the, the they have a couple of points where they attach the shuttle to the top of the airplane. And so there's this mounting post and it has a plaque on it that like an instructional plaque that says attach orbiter here. <laughs> and then and then under it, black side down. <laughs> and I love the, you know, that image. Someone being like, well, how do, which way does it go? You know? Um so so he sends me this picture and then and then I couldn't resist asking, um, what? So in this situation, what would you do? 
like you're flying this plane what do you do there's a dinosaur crawling around on the roof um and he um, and i and i just love astronauts they're just like here's the answer uh he just immediately replies pitch forward try to get negative g's <laughs> so maybe, like fling it off the roof uh then if that doesn't work dive to gain speed uh so pull it off with the wind or uh you could try rolling back and forth see if you can shake it off that way and and I, I was, I remember thinking like, now, wait a minute. Uh, we haven't talked about like where this dinosaur came from. Maybe like we thought dinosaurs were extinct, but this could be the only one like known to science. Like there's a, this is a question that I answer. How did this dinosaur get on the roof? You know, what is it? What is it? Are there more of them? Is this the only one? Like this could be an invaluable resource for paleontology, for biology in general. Like, uh, uh, you know, how do you take that into account? Instant reply just says, not my concern. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was like, you know, that's that's what you want in a pilot. <laughs> you want the pilot's like, my job is to get the plane down with the passengers safe. Yeah. The, so, the paleontology uh, is not, not, my, uh, not my area to worry about. Short answer, plane flying a T-Rex is fine as long as the T-Rex has its cell data off while the flight's in motion. Right, right. You got to, I mean, you know, once you get above 10,000 feet, you can turn on, um, you know, you can turn on the, the the devices, but you do need to keep the cell connection turned off. <laughs> cool. Let's take another question. Paul asks, how many questions posed to you involve figuring out the real life implication or consequences of having superpowers? Um, a lot of questions that people ask do involve these, which like makes sense because superpowers are sort of a way to say like what if we took this variable in real life and like s move the slider way off to one side like we make someone really strong or really fast or have them change their size or they can control this or that physical phenomenon um and so it, it's like a natural way to try to like experiment with with physics um the problem with a lot of the questions involving superheroes though is that that the superheroes have been around for a long time and like their powers have been sort of like a lot of details have been worked out. And so answering questions about them ends up being this like exercise in almost like literary analysis of being mm -hmm. like, okay, who, which, which writers have clarified, you know, Superman's x-ray vision, do the x-rays emanate from, you know, the, from Superman's eyes or does it like come back from, is it ambient x-rays that he's picking up? Like you end up having to answer all these questions that aren't really science questions. They're like literature questions mm. um, to figure out what those powers are. And so I find it's almost more fun if, if you just say like, if someone had, and then you just say what the power is, then that's like often easier to work with. If you're like, could Spider-Man do this? I'm like, well, now I've got to go read a whole bunch of Spider-Man, you know, <laughs> lore. And, Depends which Spider-Man. Yeah, and then it'll be like, oh, well, it turns out there are 10 different writers who have all tackled this question with like totally different contradictory answers. And each one is in like a different multiverse. And, uh, mm. you know, like once again, you sort of end up in this world of literary criticism more than this. <laughs> cool. Let's take another question. Brian asks, I enjoyed What If 2 a great deal. Can we have a thing explainer too? Pretty please. Oh yeah, I had a, a a lot of fun with um explaining things in this constrained language. Um but really yeah, I grew up reading those those books. Any book that had like really complicated diagrams in it, I would have a ton of fun um going over them and like like I liked diagrams that you could explore and it almost felt like you're in a video game. Mm. Like I spent a lot of time looking at like where's Waldo and figuring out where would I go if I were in this scene that Waldo's in? Mm. Like, how would I run around? Um, and I also always liked really big, uh, intricate charts, you know, and, and I got to put all those, put those together in thing explainer. And I've definitely like, what, what is the thing, thing explainer for the people that haven't yeah. read it? Yeah. So this was thing explainer is a book of diagrams of how stuff, how, how stuff works, um, like blueprints, but I illustrated them using only the thousand most common words in the English language. And so I came up with a list of words from different sources of like roughly the the thousand most common and the different forms of them, and then uh, would use them to annotate the diagrams. And so like, you know, I I drew a Saturn V rocket, which I called an upgoer five, <laughs> and and for the top, um, you know, I would illustrate all the different parts. Like, 
here is, you know, this is a, this is a, a big, like, I can't say like liquid oxygen. So I would say like, this is really cold air that you burn. And mm. then like down here, here's the engine nacelle, but I can't say those. So I'll be like, this is where the fire comes out. You know? <laughs> and, and it was a really fun exercise in like trying to figure out what things were if I don't get to use technical vocabulary. Um, and that was a, a really fun exercise. And I also really liked creating those like intricate diagrams. And so I'm definitely um, interested in doing something more like that. What's the most interesting word in the top 1000? I would say that, you know, the weirdest feature of the top 1000 was, and like the thing that if I could go in and change English, uh, I would do, I had a lot of synonyms. There were a lot of synonyms for rope that just oh. barely missed being on the list. Huh. And so, and like, I, I used a bunch of different sources. I put together a bunch of different methods. So I had some editorial control, but like all the different ways I cut it, like rope didn't make the list, cable, wire, string, yarn, twine. I didn't have any of those. Hmm. And like, sometimes that's not a problem, but there were some places where that really felt like it got in the way, you know, like try to describe the rigging of a ship where the <laughs> only word you, the only word I had was line. Huh. And, and that was tough. And so like, if I could change something, I would definitely go and just like get people to use one of those words way more often <laughs> so it qualifies for the list next time around. Um, actually, my and my favorite missing word was all the words for numbers. You know, one, two, three, four, they all made the cut easily. Mm -hmm. Also like 10, 20, uh, all the round numbers get a boost. Um, but like bigger numbers in general are less common. You know, you say three mm -hmm. more often, you say 5,824. And so I, um, and so like, two was used less often than one, three was used less often than two. And this went all the way down until nine was just barely off my list. Ooh. And so I had the numbers for Ooh. one through eight and 10. And so I could be <laughs> like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, one more than eight, <laughs> and, you know, uh, and, and, but I kind of liked that. Like yeah, that was just a fun, like, like, sorry, it's what the data says. That's uh, a fun constraint. Yeah. Cool. Let's take another question. Alan asks, have you ever started researching a super interesting, obscure question only to find that someone else had already perfectly answered it? Yeah. And, and I think like, sometimes I'm a little disappointed because I'm like, oh, I did a bunch of work. I had figured out a great answer to this, but someone did this already. Or like, you know, I try to steer away from stuff that like Mythbusters could have done mm. because like stuff that's easy to test practically. But they they had, you know, they they did some pretty impressive things that I wouldn't have necessarily thought you could you could test practically. Um, but usually when I find that, I'm just excited uh, to find the answer and to see it, like, especially if they've done, you know, an experiment where they've definitively proven it. Um, like, I really I, I really like coming across that stuff. You know, I. I I usually feel sort of relief, like, oh, okay, someone has figured this out, you know, now I can get the answer. Cause like, that's really what drives me is like, I want to know what the answer is. Mm. And so like, if someone has done all that work, I'm like happy to like, oh, good. I can just enjoy knowing, you know, um, I did, there's a, a, there have been a couple of things where I'm like, this is the most obscure, like, I bet I could do this and no one else will have done this deep dive because it's such a weird combination of topics that's right up my alley. Um, and it has multiple times I've then discovered that the YouTuber Tom Scott has mm -hmm. done precisely the thing that I was planning to do. And like, he did it really well. And like, I was like, I was so sure no one else would have done this specific thing. <laughs> and, and, but I'm always just like happy to see, oh good, there's someone else out there who's uh, thinking about this stuff the way I am. Is he the one that tried to cook a chicken by slapping it really hard? I'm not sure that one. Um, I know a, a number of people have, have weighed uh -huh. in on that one. He did a, a fun, a survey. This was another thing that I made plans to do and then discovered he had done it uh, was, you know, that, that song, um, the, the song you learned on a playground, uh, the jingle bells parody about Batman. Yes. The, the jingle bells, Batman smells Robin light egg. Yep. That no one can figure out where that came from. And it is like, huh. 60 years old it like dates back to like the 60s or 70s and it has just been like propagating out through like 
uh, playgrounds and huh. you can see regional variations as it's like mutated, like different people learn like different things that the Joker does at the end. Um, there are all these little textual variations depending on where people live, what years they grew up. Um, and you can like make a whole map of it and like hmm. survey people part out like cool when you know the Simpsons did a version of it. You could see that take over in places where the Simpsons was carried among people who were young enough. Um, and and this is a really cool thing. And you can go check out Tom Scott's video about it. Nice. Let's take another question. We still have plenty of time. Heather asks, how do you sort or manage your ideas in your workflow? You must have a ton of ideas. Are they all on post-it notes, a massive doc? Do you have a pile of unfinished work? Definitely all of those, yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like I've tried out every filing system and the result is I have a whole bunch of filing systems in parallel and each of them has some portion of what I was uh, working on. So yeah, I have a bunch of different notes things, a bunch of, you know, like one giant text file with a huge amount of stuff in it that's like backed up, but it's just a dot text file. And then I have, you know, different um, stuff along the lines of like Evernote or Google Keep or, uh, mm. you know, where I have snippets. Um, and then a lot of Mathematica notebooks because uh, I really like being able to do computations with units. And so it's you all just kind of scattered around. You just need uh, one more uh, note taking program that aggregates all your note taking programs. Right, Wait. exactly. <laughs> if we just come up with one universal standard, yeah. then we will no longer have any confusion. I think I know a guy who wrote a web comic about that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Let's take uh, another question. Dale asks, as a parent of a kid who read What If at age six and has given copies to every teacher they've had since, how does it feel to have a peace of mind of all those kids? Oh man, I'm that it's funny, like it seems obvious in retrospect, but when I was doing what if it didn't occur to me that like kids would want to know the answers to these questions and that these would be like uh, uh, kids who are excited about science, you know, would really enjoy reading these. Um, and so I've mostly enjoyed um, that it's then provoked uh, a lot of parents to send in their kids questions um, because those do tend to be like the most fun and kind of surprising questions. Mm. Um, and it's and it's nice because you know I remember reading reading science books and consuming you know things like educational stuff as a kid and just getting very excited about about uh, concepts I learned there. And it's fun to like try to be able to give back a little of that. Nice. Let's take another question. Juan asks, I'm very passionate about creative ways to enhance science communication. From the perspective of teaching efficacy, what has been your favorite what if answer? Um, I think there have been, there's there's a question um, in what if two that I mentioned and another in, uh, the there are a couple of questions in what if two and then one in what if one that involve traveling through time and space. And those where it's like, you know, if you, if you drove to the edge of the universe or if you um, walked across the continent, you know, if you went back in time to this, this period. Um, and those are fun, interesting because they put together a bunch of different areas of science. Like you have to think about if you're walking across North America, you know, going back in time, you have to learn about like, how light would work differently if time was running really fast, you know, um, just, and you make some assumptions about how it's set up. But like, if you had the sun flickering across the sky, like how much would it get darker and lighter as weather systems changed? You know, would, um, does the weather tend to be cloudy and then clear for like several weeks at a time or, you know, several days? That'll affect the flicker that you would see. Um, how would, uh, you know, how quickly do rivers meander? That becomes important because you'd have to think how, what would you see with the rivers, you know, moving across the landscape at, uh, you know, 4 million times their normal speed? Um, would, uh, uh, like, how do trees grow? How, how would, um, you know, things that are spreading across the land, how quickly do they move? How quickly do trees advance? Um, and then when we get to the glaciers, I had to think about like, not just how quickly did the glaciers advance across the land, but how much did they move forward and backward with like the annual cycle? Um, and all these questions, like they all come from this one really simple premise. Um, but then like 
you end up exploring like almost every area of like natural science, just trying to, to answer like, what would you see? And so I sort of like those questions about like, if you went to this unusual vantage point, what would it look like? Because it just forces you to like consider everything. Hmm. Nice. Let's take another question. Mike asks, you cover some pretty complex topics in your work. How do you decide what is safe to assume that your audience will understand, especially for XKCD where you have a limited space to explain concepts? I don't know. I think I, I usually just sort of assume that like, once I'm able to understand, once if I've been able to figure this out, um, then I, if I really get understand it, I should be able to like explain it to other people. You know, I don't think, um, uh, and if I don't, it's just because I haven't figured out the right way to 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 describe it or to talk about it. You know, but I, I don't know. I I I, I assume. I sort of just assume that people are interested in the same way that I'm interested in it and then try to show them, here's how I figured it out. And for the most part, people seem to be able to follow that, you know, um, like, like they're not always as interested in me as the, at the, in the specific thing, but like, that's okay. You know, no one's going to be interested in exactly the same things as me. Um, but I just try to assume like, if they are interested, here's how I got there. I'll try to show you, you know, so you can follow along with me and, 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 uh, and just have faith that that uh, that people will want to explore things with you. One more question from the audience. Evan asks, what were some of the most involved experiments or things you had to do for research? Um, I've definitely had to reach out to a lot of um, you know, interesting experts, um, do a lot of calculations. There was one question uh, that someone asked for, uh, uh, for what if two that was, if I had to read all of the laws that apply to me, how long would that take? You know, like, cause like they say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You know, how do you know if what your, you know, your hobbies are against the law or not? Like maybe there's a law against, uh, that particular kind of ballet or, you know, that uh, gardening with this plant, you know, maybe there are regulations. Um, and so, and I thought that was a fun question and I could sort of tally up what are all the sources of law. And, and that ended up, I got in touch with the librarians at uh, Harvard Law School, the, the law library there. And this ended up being such an interesting and like deep question about like what constitutes the primary parts of the law and like inform what's information that you need to interpret it. And like, uh, how do you think about case law, which like affects interpretation of the law even, and, and in some cases is like a source of law itself. And, and it ended up like, they ended up almost spending as much time as me just like debating this and discussing <laughs> this. And like, it was a huge conversation. And like, I came up with a tally, I came up with like, here's my rough answer, but, but that is a complicated question. For sure. We actually have time for one more question. So Amber asks, what's the answer you've researched that has wound up having the most actual practical use, whether intended or not? Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure what's necessarily been practical to me, but one that now and then an answer that I, I research, it'll surprise me because it will turn out to be a really practically important question. Um, someone asked, wrote in for, for what if two and asked, they said, you know, I noticed that when I buy a new tire, the treads are like thick, you know, it's got the, they, they stick out, but then like, by the time the tire is used up, they're, they're really thin. They're almost bald. Um, so why aren't the roads getting thicker with rubber? Like, hmm. where's all that rubber going? Huh. And I remember thinking when I saw that, I'm like, oh, well, I think that's not really how that works. Right. But then I realized, like, I don't know how that works. I'm going to have to look at like research, like, uh, how do tires work? You know, how much rubber are we talking about? And it turns out tires do lose rubber. Hmm. Um, and the question of where it goes is a really important one. Cause it turns out the answer is everywhere. Hmm. Like they, they shed, like they'll leave, they'll leave behind, uh, streaks on the pavement sometimes. Like if you skid, if you break too hard, but 
in the course of normal driving, they also shed little bits of rubber. And it doesn't come off in like a uniform sheet on the road that's like a molecule thick. It comes off in little flecks and bits and these you know, micro particles that some of them uh, do lie on the road and get washed away by the rain. Some of them go into the air and drift away uh, into the surrounding environment. Um, you can find them in the dirt by roadsides, in trees. We breathe them in, they go into the water and we don't really know what effect they're having. Uh, and and this, this uh, there's a paper from a couple of years ago linking one of the chemicals in tire rubber to uh, salmon die off in the Pacific Northwest. Huh. But it's all like, like, we're really not sure about any of this. And like, if there is a specific chemical in rubber that is, that's like causing huge environmental problems, then we should definitely be working on like swapping that out, you know, finding a substitute. Um, and if it turns out that there's no easy way to swap it out, then I'm not sure what the best solution is. There's actually, there's a team that came up with a proposal for basically like little vacuum cleaners that would be behind your your wheel as you drove and like suck up the rubber particles and collect them so that they, hmm. you know, don't go into the air and into our lungs and stuff. Um, and, and I don't think that's a practical solution. Like I looked at the proposal, it's a cool proposal, but I just have trouble imagining that would work. But I also don't have a better idea. So like, there's an engineering problem that actually someone really should be solving this. Like, figure out what are these what are these particles doing? Is it bad? Maybe they're not a problem, you know. But we should we should know one way or the other. Um, and so, I ended up with like ending that chapter with a sort of uh, surprising like, if you're interested in going into engineering, this is something that could use some attention. You know, <laughs> some, it seems like someone should probably figure this out. Uh, and so hopefully maybe some someone will read my book and uh, uh, you know be like, hey, that's an interesting question, and and then figure out what's the deal with tire rubber and and what can we do about it. Some six year old who reads your book will uh, yeah. grow up to solve these great problems. Or maybe ideally like a teenager or someone, so we don't have to wait. Or like a six year old <laughs> who solves it when they're eight or nine. Like I'm like we we should we should hurry up on this one. So <laughs> it's a real maybe, maybe to inspire us slightly like. What's the optimal age to inspire someone where they can like quickly get into the industry? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining me, Randall. This has been a blast. No, this is a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for watching another edition of Talks at Google.